Certainly it's a blessing to have each of you here. We do actually have some who are visiting with us and we are glad that you have joined us. Please be turning your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah the 55th chapter. Uh, we know when we look at the life of Christ that God is interested in our salvation. Jesus extends some wonderful invitations for people to come to him, probably one of the more familiar to us. Is in Matthew chapter 11, you'll recall when he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And that's a very well-known uh, section. And there are some others in which, uh, through the gospel, certainly through the apostles' proclamation of Christ, all men are being invited to come to the Lord. And then you think about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he's inviting people as he prepares them to be kingdom citizens what kind of character they ought to have, what kind of disposition, what it really means to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. But Isaiah 55, and really the whole book of Isaiah, many of the prophets, when you go back and read those prophets, as in many cases they were foretelling of the coming of the Messiah and the message of the gospel, you'll see some real similarity between, for instance, Isaiah and the book of Isaiah and the kinds of things Jesus says as the Son of God. And so I want us to focus on Isaiah 55. And this is a rather beautiful section, I think, throughout Isaiah. We come into Isaiah 53, which is probably one of the most familiar sections. And for good reason, we think about Philip and the eunuch. And of course, Isaiah 53 was being read, and he wants to know is this man talking about himself or somebody else? And uh, of course, Philip preaches Jesus to him, and he is baptized into Christ. And there are a lot of sections. You look at Romans, for instance, Romans chapter 10, a lot of passages from Isaiah throughout the book of Romans really are cited as salvation in Christ is discussed. But we're going to focus on Isaiah 55. We're right in this section where the suffering servant is being discussed and is being prophesied about whom, of course, is, is Christ and just to appreciate very quickly, when you look at Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 is inviting people to consider this future sacrifice of the Messiah. And then we come to Isaiah chapter 54. Not only are we being invited to consider the sacrifice of God's faithful Messiah and the Christ, but we see his promised redemption in Isaiah chapter 54. Well, that finally leads us to Isaiah chapter 55. And so after he has been talking about uh, the sacrifice and the love of God and the promised redemption of God for his people. He speaks of salvation. And that's really what we're going to be talking about this morning as we consider this great invitation. And we're just going to try to get right in here in Isaiah chapter, chapter 55 and consider this uh, context. And so let's, let's begin as we think about this great invitation and we look into Isaiah chip, chapter 55. And I want to begin by just seeing this invitation into this abundant life of grace and see the correlation between what Isaiah is promising and what Christ really offered. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 55 and just the first two verses here. He says, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. One of the first things he says to us here as we think about this invitation into the abundant life of grace is simply this. And that is salvation is for the thirsty. No one is going to be saved against their will. So notice what he says there in verse 1. This metaphor of thirst is very common in Scripture for those who desire to be with God. And those who desire salvation, the most basic desire from a human standpoint. You're not going to live very long without water. And so he says, oh, everyone who thirsts, if you're thirsty for salvation, if you're thirsty for fellowship with God, come to the waters. Here are the resources. This is what you need. And so Isaiah uses this 
metaphor. Come back to Isaiah chapter 44. We're going to look at some different sections in Isaiah just quickly. But, but Isaiah chapter 44, similarly, he says in verse 3, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land. And streams on the dry ground, and I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, and my blessing on your descendants, and they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. You think about the notion of water, even physically, you think of refreshment, don't you? If you're really, really, really thirsty, and you get a cold glass of water, There's refreshment, there's fulfillment, there's satisfaction there. And throughout Scripture we see this, especially in the prophets, the notion of eternal water or the living waters of salvation. This is a very common metaphor. You know, the psalmist does the same thing. We sing some psalms with that very same metaphor, but let's come to Isaiah, or Psalms rather 42. Come to Psalms 42 and just notice the very poetic Language. This is something we all should be able to understand, but we need to bring it to the spiritual realm. Psalms 42. He says, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Or maybe we come to the 63rd Psalm, Psalms 63. And verse 1, Psalm 63 and verse 1, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. And we're familiar with this kind of language. It's beautiful. It's powerful. We can relate to it very quickly. We understand it. Are our souls really thirsty for salvation? Are we thirsty for Christ? Are we thirsty for truth? You know, it's not uncommon for us to just get caught up in in going through the motions Maybe as we sing, as we pray, as we even read scripture, hear scripture read. And then we're put in difficult situations and then we are challenged and we realize we're not as thirsty for the Lord as we used to be. Those who are thirsty for Christ will come to the waters. There's something for me to do. And so Isaiah says the very same thing. Now let's think about Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. When he's talking about the kingdom, he uses very similar language. He's saying, listen, you have to be thirsty for God to be filled. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 20, he makes the point, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. He wasn't saying they are righteous, but I just want you to be more righteous. He was saying, listen, their righteousness isn't real righteousness at all. Their righteousness is fake. Their righteousness is superficial. It's filled with corruption and hypocrisy. It's self-righteousness. It's not the righteousness of God. But I want you to truly be right with God and with your fellow man. And in order to do that, he would say in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. That's Matthew 5, verse 6. Or think about when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And he uses language she would have been very familiar with as a Samaritan woman. With Jacob's well and some of the notions the Samaritans had. And he says, listen, salvation is of the Jews. And Jerusalem right now is the place you ought to go to worship. But there's coming a time when geographical location won't matter at all. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But in John 4, he says, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. What does all this say to us? It says to us that if we are thirsty 
and hungry and burdened, we need to come to the waters of Christ. And that's not just for the person who realizes I'm bankrupt before God, I'm a sinner, I need to obey the gospel. It certainly is for that man or woman. It is for that person. But it's for us too. As Christians, don't lose that hunger and that thirst. And and the more that I thirst for truth, the more truth I will receive in the word of God. So salvation is for the thirsty. Let's go to the, the next thought. Salvation is for the poor. Come back to Isaiah chapter 55 with me. Isaiah chapter 55, and let's keep reading. He says, salvation is for the thirsty, but then he says, and you who have no money. So you think, okay, I'm going to have to purchase this. Now we have a financial exchange concept or figure. And he says, no, you know, the wonderful thing is for those of you who realize you can't earn this. Now, there are conditions for you to meet. There are things for you to do. But he would go on and say, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. And somebody says, wait a minute, Isaiah. If I don't have any money, how am I going to come, buy, and eat? Well, that's because salvation is for the poor. And let me explain what I mean. Do you remember what Christ says in his Sermon on the Mount once again? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3. What was he saying? He's not talking about your bank account, by the way. He's saying those of you who understand you need the mercy of the Father... You're dependent, you're impoverished in spirit, you're humble. He's talking about humility. Those who are poor in spirit are those who are humble. Coming back to Isaiah, Isaiah 61 helps us understand. And I'm sure Jesus is drawing on this, Isaiah 61. And this is messianic, by the way. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. This is talking about the Messiah. To bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God. Listen to him. This is this sounds like what Jesus is saying, to comfort all who what? All who mourn. A lot of times we'll see passages like this used at at funerals, and that's okay. That's all right. But this mourning is actually talking about anyone who is recognizing they are dependent on God. They need God. And so Isaiah says, if you're thirsty, come to the water, but you need to understand you can't earn this. Again, there are conditions you might meet. You know, the church at Laodicea had a problem with thinking they were rich when they were actually poor. That's a problem, isn't it? That's a, he's talking to a church. He says, you're lukewarm. And they thought they were rich and full. And he says, you're wretched and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked. Could that happen to us? This great invitation is not for those who are self-satisfied. This great invitation that we read about in Isaiah 55 is not for those who say, I'm going to be able to depend on myself in this situation. No, they are those who depend on the Lord. They truly understand. They don't have anything to bring but their hearts and their lives, and they humbly lay that down at the throne of heaven, and God will make them full through Christ, Colossians 2 and verse 10. But then going back to Isaiah 55, there's, a, there's another concept here in this verse. So salvation's for the thirsty. And salvation's for the poor. And salvation, even though, this is the interesting comparison or contrast, even though it's for the poor, the salvation itself is abundant and it's rich. So notice what he says. Back in uh, Isaiah 55, Everyone who thirsts come to the waters, and you who have no money come by and eat, and come by wine and milk without money and without cost. What does it mean, wine and milk? Well, wine and milk during this time are what the wealthy had. 
that was luxurious. Here lately at the grocery store, it might be kind of luxurious for us, but it was luxurious. Not just everybody had access to all of that. And so what he's saying when he says wine and milk is he said, you know, God's not going to skimp on you. He's not just going to give you, you know, the minimum amount. Think about Paul's language that he gives us in the Lord's church exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We have all spiritual blessings in Christ. You know, it's interesting throughout Isaiah, and you can see it in, 40, in chapter 46 and chapter 44 and throughout when he's talking about idolaters. He says, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically the idolater, and this is pretty much said there in chapter 46, but, but the idolater pours himself out in worshiping this false god. And when the false gods wouldn't respond, you remember in the case of Elijah, they're slitting their wrist and, and they don't know what to do. And they make that idol say what they want it to say. And they pour, and Isaiah talks about how they pour all their money out for this false god. They pour their gold and their silver out, but he describes them pouring their gold and silver out as those who are feeding on ashes. You know, brethren, a lot of the times we feed on ashes because what we desire is not the water of salvation. We're kind of like that idolater. We may not have a golden image, but we've created our version of God that's not the God of the Bible at all, and we feed on ashes. And we pour things out for that which does not satisfy. And it shows a lack of discernment. It's pointless labor. Look, though, at Isaiah 55. He says, listen, if you'll come to the true and living God, you can purchase by God's grace wine and milk without money, without cost. Now look at verse 2. Now he flips this to my point. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy. He says, listen carefully to me and eat what is good and deliver yourself in abundance. Why are you pursuing all the wrong thing? So we pursue money and we pursue, you know, popularity and we pursue acceptance and all of that over salvation and the Lord and truth. You think for, with me for a moment. How many people have compromised truth for money? By the way, it's not a short list. How many people have, have compromised truth to be accepted socially? And I think Isaiah would say, why are you spending your money on that which is not bread? Why are you worried about those kinds of things? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Let me tell you, putting the Lord first in your life, making a decision to pursue moral purity, making a decision to encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ, making a decision to worship God with all of your heart, you're never going to regret that. You're never going to look back and say, if you're of right mind, that is a waste. But there are a whole lot of folks that waste their opportunities to be with their family, to, to parent their children, to love their brethren, to worship God, and they waste their life. And at the very end, they get some awareness and they look back and they think, why was I spending my money on those things that were not bread? Why was I trying to feed on ashes? And so Isaiah says, salvation is abundant and rich if you'll come to the Lord. And so Jesus would say in John 10, 10, those who come to me, I will give life and I will give it more abundantly. So you're only going to get two points of this lesson this morning, so don't panic. Right, this is number two and this is the final point. 
Tonight, we'll talk about some other things from Isaiah 55. And I wish we could have covered more, but you're glad that I made this decision, I promise you. Okay, so here's, here's the second thought. I will tell you what those other points are going to be that we're going to talk about tonight in just a minute. But here's the, the second thought. So an invitation to the abundant life of grace. But there's something else here. There is an invitation to the faithfulness of God's promises. We can trust God. And so that's why we can come to the waters. Now I want you to look with me. There, there's a very important section here in Isaiah 55. And it's real easy to read over. But it's actually mentioned in Acts 13. And we'll get there in just a moment. But I want you to look at Isaiah 55 with me. After he says these things we've looked at, verse 3, Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. The King James Version, I think, says the sure mercies of David. What is he really saying? He's saying, listen. There is this covenant, this Davidic covenant, these promises that were made to David, and this cues us in to now he's about to um, go into the promise of the Messiah, Jesus. So Isaiah 55 actually is pointing toward Christ. And so he says, these sure mercies of David. What are these sure mercies of David? He's saying, listen, this invitation is into a relationship with a faithful God with a faithful God he's a gracious God but he is a faithful God we know in Hebrews 6 he's immutable in his promises which means he's unfailing in his promises and there is a word and I want you to think about this with me there is a word and it's rendered different ways depending on the translation uh, some translations will render this particular Hebrew word loving kindness others will render it Faithfulness. It's the, it, it is a Hebrew word, and I know you could care less, but the Hebrew word is hesed. And hesed means covenant faithfulness. It means a faithful love. We sing that song, faithful love. But that's what that Hebrew term means, is faithful love. In other words, the reason God's true to his promise is because he's faithful in his love for those to whom he made the promises. So when you come into God, you're coming into service to a faithful God. Now, here's the thing. This covenant, the condition that he asks by his grace of us is that we respond in faith and loyalty. The, the word could also be rendered as covenant loyalty or faithful loyalty. You know, when the Bible says we have faith, that includes trust. There's no doubt about it. We trust Jesus. But some people have really diminished what it means to have faith. To have faith is to be faithful. It is to be loyal to our king. It is to give allegiance to our king. It is to give fidelity to him because he is my Lord. And so what kind of God is he? He's a faithful God. I want you to notice that sure mercies of David, the faithful mercy shown to David. What is that talking about? Well, first of all, we know, turn to Acts chapter 13, that it means he is faithful to forgive us. He's faithful to forgive us. Why is he faithful to forgive us? Because he promised us he would be. Now he has laid out conditions. It's not an unconditional forgiveness. We must turn our hearts to him and we must repent and seek him, but it's by his mercy he is faithful to his promise to forgive. You know, in Acts chapter 13, Paul is preaching. Look here with me in verse 32 as he's preaching. And notice he's quoting from some different Old Testament scripture. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. That God has fulfilled this promise to our children in whom he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm. So he tells us where to go on this one. You are my son today I've begotten you. Okay, that's Psalms 2. Verse 34. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings or sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. And he goes on to speak of David. 
What, what is this sure mercies of David? He made promises to David. Acts 2 talks about the same thing. He made promises to David that would be fulfilled in Christ. We can read in 2 Samuel, for instance, in chapter 7, about the promised reign of the Messiah at the right hand of God. I want you to turn to Psalms 89 before we close this up. We can also read... Not only in that section, but in Daniel chapter 7 about his exaltation and his reign. There are promises that were made to Abraham. In thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. We're very familiar with those. Galatians 3 says God was true to that Abrahamic promise to give salvation through Christ. There were promises also made to David. And although the promises were made to David, they weren't about David. This is Peter's point in Acts 2. They were about the Christ because David himself would never have fulfilled these promises, but they were made to David. These are the sure mercies of God to David. God loves us. He's true to his promise, and you can read that in the Scripture. But in Psalms 89, in Psalms 89, notice, notice this section. I'll just notice a few verses with you. Psalms 89, we see God's faithfulness to forgive our sins and God's faithfulness regarding the Messiah's reign. Look here in Psalms 89 in verse 1. I will sing of the loving kindness. That is that word I was telling you about. It means, when he says loving kindness, I will sing of the faithful loyalty of my God. I will sing of the faithful love of my God. I mean, any of those phrases would be true. I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever to all generations. I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. For I have said loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. Listen, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. How do you do that? Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Let's look at a few other verses here. Verse 27. Verse 27. He says this. I will also make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever. Listen, and his throne as the days of heaven. That's through the Messiah. And then look at verse 33. In 33, he says, but I will not break off my loving kindness or my faithfulness from him. Now, that doesn't mean an individual can't leave the Lord. He's saying no matter what he does, I'm going to be faithful through Christ. He says, I will uh, nor deal falsely in my faithfulness, my covenant, verse 34. I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. One I, once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever uh, like the moon and the witness, and the sky is faithful. He says, now you have spurned the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown in the dust. But you're unfaithful. I will be faithful. And he was to the promise he gave to David. Jesus comes through the Davidic lineage. Jesus Christ comes through Abraham's lineage and the Davidic lineage and he is in the flesh and he dies for our sins and he suffers for us and he's raised the third day and he calls us to come to a God that is faithful. Listen to the point in Isaiah though. You can come to God and you can know that he will be faithful. This world will not be faithful. Sin certainly will not be. If you live for the pleasure of the flesh, it will betray you. But God, through Christ, is faithful. He is faithful. And as you seek him in loyalty, he will never turn his back on you. He will never turn away from you. He will always be faithful, even in your sorrow, even when you're hurting, 
even when you're shedding tears in anguish, our God will be faithful. And we're going to stop right there. I will mention to you, tonight uh, at 5 o'clock, and if you can listen online, if you're not going to be here in, uh, certainly you won't be here in presence probably, a few of us will, uh, please listen for the rest of this because it gets very, we've talked about God and what he does for us, but there's some real practical things for our lives. He's going to invite us to, to follow God. And I want to talk to you a little bit about calling on the name of the Lord and what that means tonight because a lot of people are confused and it's here in Isaiah 55. He says something else in verses 10 and 11 that's very encouraging and it has been to me through the years and I hope it will be to you as well. He makes the statement, my word, my word will not return into me void. It won't return into me empty. Sometimes we think if people don't respond the way they ought to respond that somehow that's just waste. No, my word will not return into me void. You preach my word, you let me take care of the results. You don't worry about, well, is there going to be a negative response or positive response? You preach the truth, and you let me take care of the results. We'll talk about that. And he ends by talking about the fact this is an invitation into the victory of God, and it's a beautiful section here at the end of Isaiah 55. So those will be the three things we talk about tonight. I appreciate your good attention, and we're so very thankful that you were with us today and worship to God and all those who have joined us in worship and so I hope that this will be encouraging to you, and especially in times of difficulty, to know that we serve a God of grace, and we serve a God of mercy and love. We serve a God that is faithful, and because of that, don't you want to be his child? do you want to serve a God like that? I want to serve him, and I know you want to serve him as well. If you're not a Christian, come to the waters. If you're thirsty for Jesus, come to the waters and be refreshed and be saved and be reconciled. Obey the gospel now as together we stand and we sing.